Certainly. Here's a revised version of the passage. Indeed, my spouse betrayed me, ultimately leaving me for another man. Initially, fury consumed me, compelling thoughts of vengeance against them both. Yet, such intentions never materialized. Strangely, my narrative may seem like one seeking retribution, but it was never my intent. I'm Randy Clipson, an ordinary individual. Never a standout in terms of looks, I struggled with weight for much of my life. It was only in high school, thanks to football, that this changed. It was during those years on the field that I earned the moniker Chipper for my knack at bringing opponents down. Standing at 6 feet 3 inches tall and weighing in at 260 pounds, football became an expected pursuit. While not exceptional in athletics, my robust upper body strength, even back then, allowed me to overpower defensive linemen. Football proved transformative during my high school tenure. Shedding the weight I had long carried, I still harbored a trace of my former self. However, the bulk of muscle I acquired offset any remnants of fat. Yet, despite these physical changes, the mental scars of being labeled a fatty and enduring childhood ridicule lingered. However, as a football player, the taunt ceased, granting me a newfound confidence. Belonging to the football team bestowed certain privileges, notably altering my social standing with girls. Although I didn't catch the attention of cheerleaders, some girls were receptive to my company. Despite this, my dating life remained modest until my senior year, when I crossed paths with Cindy. Certainly. Here's a rewritten version of the passage. Cindy Crawley joined our school community in the latter part of my junior year, though it wasn't until senior year that she caught my attention. Despite possessing a remarkably beautiful face, Cindy carried extra weight, a characteristic that deterred many boys in our class. I must confess, initially, I too failed to see beyond her appearance. It wasn't until we were paired together in chemistry that I truly began to understand her. Chemistry posed significant challenges for me, yet Cindy effortlessly navigated its complexities, offering invaluable assistance. Without her guidance, I might have faltered and missed out on opportunities for higher education. As we worked together, I discovered her amiable and humorous nature, as well as a shared experience. We both entered school later than most. Cindy's delay stemmed from a congenital heart condition that required correction over 18 months, while I started school a year behind due to my late birthday. This commonality bridged the gap between us, emboldening me to ask her out. Initially, Cindy seemed cautious about my motives, and I understood why. While my early school years were challenging, hers were even more tumultuous, marked by relentless teasing and cruel pranks. Despite her hesitance, she eventually agreed to go on a date with me. Our outing was straightforward, a trip to the movies followed by an ice cream soda. Although enjoyable, my timidity prevented me from attempting a kiss, opting instead for a handshake and the promise of future contact, which visibly delighted her. Over the following weeks, we continued to see each other, gradually building a connection. By our third date, I summoned the courage to plant a kiss on Cindy's cheek, marking a step towards intimacy. Our relationship progressed, culminating in more affectionate gestures, eventually reaching what some might call first base. With each interaction, my feelings for Cindy deepened. Meanwhile, our high school football team, typically overlooked, experienced an unexpected surge in success. Bolstered by standout players like quarterback Kirk Simmons and the Bailey Twins, Todd and Jason, our team found its stride. As the left tackle, entrusted with protecting Kirk's vulnerable side, I took pride in my role, ensuring he remained untouched by opposing defenders. Overall, both my burgeoning romance with Cindy and our football season were unfolding in unexpected, yet promising, directions. Our season started on a sour note with a close loss to the formidable Mohawk High, ending 21-17. Known for their football prowess, Mohawk High posed a tough challenge. However, undeterred, we rallied and secured seven consecutive victories, propelling us to the regional championships. Our journey reached its pinnacle at the state finals, where we faced Towson High and fell short with a final score of 28-14. Yet, amidst this disappointment, there was a sweet victory over Mohawk High in the semifinals, triumphing 38-7, which left us immensely satisfied. I apologize for indulging in nostalgia. Revisiting the glory days of high school football is a rare treat. Returning to matters of the heart, my relationship with Cindy flourished, progressing to deeper levels of intimacy. 
As prom season approached, I eagerly asked Cindy to accompany me, eliciting an enthusiastic response. In the four weeks leading up to the prom, Cindy embarked on a determined effort to shed about 20 pounds, fitting into her chosen prom dress. On the night of the prom, I was captivated by Cindy's beauty. Despite societal norms, I found her absolutely stunning. Clad in a light blue prom dress that accentuated her curves, especially her ample bosom, Cindy exuded elegance. The dress, barely containing her breasts, showcased her natural beauty in a way that left me in awe. The night unfolded like a dream as Cindy and I danced together, lost in each other's company. As the evening drew to a close, I suggested parking, but Cindy had a different plan in mind. Leading me to a secluded wooded area 30 miles outside town, she revealed her uncle's hunting cabin, a cozy retreat with basic amenities. The cabin, though modest, provided the perfect setting for our intimate encounter. After some playful moments on the sofa, I helped Cindy out of her prom dress, eliciting a passionate response as I pleasured her. When it was my turn, expecting a familiar gesture, Cindy surprised me by leading us to the bed, where she stood before me, naked and enticing. Overwhelmed with desire, I hurriedly prepared with a condom, seizing the opportunity that fate seemed to offer. Following Cindy's lead, our lovemaking unfolded with a mix of anticipation and exploration. The sensation of entering her for the first time defied description, an experience akin to celestial bliss. Though my climax came swiftly, Cindy's understanding demeanor alleviated any feelings of inadequacy. Eager to please each other, our passion intensified as Cindy guided me through new experiences. Her willingness to embrace intimacy in all its forms, including oral pleasure, surprised and thrilled me. Entranced by her desire, I surrendered to the moment, finding ecstasy in her embrace. Despite our passionate escapades, I managed to return Cindy home well before a curfew, a feat that left us both satisfied and eager for the next chapter of our journey together. Cindy and I remained inseparable throughout the rest of high school, sharing intimate moments whenever opportunity allowed, always prioritizing safe sex practices. As graduation approached, I received a partial football scholarship to a Division II school two states away, while Cindy chose to pursue her studies at the local community college. My focus was on computer science, while Cindy delved into psychology. Facing the reality of our impending separation, we deliberated on the fate of our relationship. Ultimately, we mutually agreed to part ways, believing it unfair to hold each other back. It was a heartbreaking decision, weighing heavily on my conscience. The prospect of leaving Cindy behind as I embarked on my college journey filled me with profound sadness and uncertainty. Despite her reassurances that fate would guide us, I feared losing her. Yet, honoring my commitment to Mountain Ridge University, I resolved to immerse myself fully in my studies and football training. Driven by a relentless work ethic, I dedicated myself to excelling both on the field and in the classroom. Despite warnings from coaches, I pursued a full course load, embracing the rigorous demands of collegiate athletics. The intense physical training transformed my physique, replacing lingering fat with formidable muscle strength. Financial burdens weighed heavily on my family, who struggled to cover the remaining expenses of my education. Though unable to provide financial support, I remained connected to Cindy through weekly phone calls, sharing in the lingering pain of our separation. My freshman year proved successful, with achievements both athletically and academically. Securing a spot in the starting lineup as left guard, I contributed to our team's commendable 8-2 and two season record. Academically, I earned recognition on the dean's list, a source of pride for my parents. During the summer break, Cindy and I rekindled our connection, reigniting feelings of love and longing. Reflecting on our relationship, I grappled with whether it was genuine love or mere infatuation. After much contemplation, I concluded that, for me, it was indeed love, as a part of my heart still holds affection for her. During the summer, I juggled work with three online courses, driven by a fierce determination to complete college swiftly. Cindy and I resumed our intimate activities, with me eagerly exploring every inch of her body at every opportunity. Upon graduating college in three years, Cindy and I tied the knot immediately after. We both secured positions at Triorbit Electronics, a multinational software and electronics corporation in Virginia. I delved into software development, while Cindy found her place in human resources. 
Two years into our careers, we amassed enough savings to purchase a modest home and began contemplating starting a family. The initial years of our marriage were joyful, except for one issue. We both struggled with significant weight gain. Cindy's weight surged to 230 pounds, while I tipped the scales at 310 pounds. Although I carried the weight better due to my height, neither of us was content with our size. Nevertheless, my love for Cindy remained unwavering, regardless of her physical appearance. After consulting our doctor regarding our struggles to conceive, we embarked on a rigorous diet regimen for the first time in our lives. Six months later, Cindy had shed 50 pounds, while I managed a 25-pound reduction, albeit with some cheating on my part. As Cindy's weight loss became evident, she attracted newfound attention, prompting her to intensify her efforts by committing to a rigorous gym routine. Motivated by Cindy's transformation, I redoubled my own efforts, strictly adhering to our diet and joining her at the gym. Over the course of a year, Cindy lost 80 pounds, while I shed 90 pounds, both of us experiencing a significant boost in confidence. However, unforeseen challenges lay ahead. As Cindy's appearance evolved, she began to embrace more revealing clothing, drawing attention and admiration from others, including comments at work that left me uneasy. My discomfort escalated when Kirk Simmons, now a senior director at the company, assumed the role of Cindy's boss. Initially, I dismissed any concerns, given Kirk's marital status and Cindy's history of being overlooked. However, as interactions between Cindy and Kirk intensified, fueled by office social events, my unease grew. Though dancing with Kirk's wife Susie at a company Christmas party evoked a familiar physical response, I was surprised by her genuine warmth and approachability. Despite these encounters, mounting apprehension clouded my thoughts, signaling potential challenges ahead in navigating the complexities of office dynamics and personal boundaries. Susie, I barely recognized you and Kirk when you two arrived, Susie complimented us. You both look absolutely stunning. Cindy has always had a beautiful face, but now she's just breathtaking. You better keep a close eye on her. Thank you, that's very kind, I replied, feeling a bit bashful. You both look fantastic as well. Kirk hasn't aged a bit since high school, and you seem even more radiant. Thank you, that's really sweet of you, Susie blushed slightly as the music came to an end. Five months before our fourth anniversary, Cindy dropped a bombshell. She wanted to go back on birth control pills. What about our plans for kids? I objected. I've decided I'm not ready for that yet, she stated bluntly. Just like that. You've decided? I couldn't hide my frustration. Listen, we'll have children eventually, she assured me, caressing my arm. I just want to enjoy being slim for a while longer. Looking back, I should have recognized the warning signs, but I was oblivious. I trusted Cindy completely. Little did I know, Kirk had been making advances towards her. Flattered by the attention from the former football captain, Cindy was oblivious to the brewing storm. My suspicions grew when Cindy started working late and going out with girlfriends more frequently. Though I tried to ignore the nagging doubts, her increasingly late arrivals home sparked concern. Hiring a private investigator seemed extreme, but within a week, they unearthed irrefutable evidence of Cindy's infidelity, videos of her and Kirk engaging in intimate acts, photos of their cozy dinners, and even evidence of Kirk visiting our home behind my back. The pain of betrayal was indescribable, akin to a physical blow to the gut. Discovering that my wife was cheating with someone I once considered a friend shattered my trust and left me reeling. Despite my shattered heart, I clung to the hope that confronting Cindy would lead to a resolution. With the evidence in hand, I broached the topic that evening, hoping for some explanation or reconciliation. Cindy's initial reaction of shock and tears seemed promising, but her subsequent withdrawal left me sitting alone in the kitchen, drowning my sorrows in a glass of rum. What do you have to say? I demanded, my tone icy. I didn't intend for any of this to happen, Cindy murmured, her voice barely audible. Oh, so it all just magically unfolded? He accidentally tripped and fell into bed with you? I retorted, my anger bubbling to the surface. There's no need to be vulgar, Cindy snapped back. If you had paid more attention to me, maybe things wouldn't have gone this way. Her words caught me off guard, momentarily stirring doubt, but anger quickly resurfaced. Don't you dare try to shift the blame onto me. 
I've done nothing wrong. You're the one who's been unfaithful. You've been caught. What do you have to say for yourself? She avoided my gaze, her silence speaking volumes. So, what's the plan here? I struggled to maintain composure. Are you choosing Kirk over me, or are you committed to salvaging our marriage? I love you, Randy, but I also have feelings for Kirk, she confessed tearfully. Well, a decision needs to be made, I stated, biting back frustration. I want an answer by tomorrow. If you choose to stay with me, you cut all ties with Kirk. You need to resign from your job, and we'll seek counseling. Cindy nodded in acquiescence. I stormed into our bedroom, gathering her belongings and tossing them into the hallway. You'll be in the guest room until you figure things out. The next day, I returned home early, my mind in turmoil, unable to focus at work. Anxiety gnawed at my stomach, threatening to overwhelm me. Around six in the evening, Cindy entered, her expression fraught with nerves. I remained seated at the kitchen table, mirroring the previous night's scene. She took a seat opposite me. So, have you made your decision? I pressed. Tears trickled down her cheeks. You know I love you, Randy, but I can't let go of Kirk. I love him too. I exhaled deeply, masking the ache in my heart. You made your choice. Cindy's silent acknowledgement cut deeper than any words could. My mind raced, torn between fury and despair, oscillating between thoughts of violence and overwhelming grief. You've picked quite the catch, I remarked bitterly. Kirk and Susie just welcomed a baby boy. Does it even cross your mind that your decision leaves the child fatherless? A flicker of anger and shame danced across Cindy's features. Kirk was planning to leave Susie even before we got together, she defended. So, just like that, you're willing to discard nearly four years of marriage? I choked back not only my rage, but also the tears, fighting an inner battle between lashing out and crumbling under the weight of betrayal. Truth be told, in that moment, the urge to lash out violently against Cindy and Kirk felt almost overwhelming. I'm sorry if I've hurt you, Randy, Cindy's voice softened with tenderness. I never meant for any of this to cause you pain. But I've fallen deeply in love with Kirk, and he feels the same for me. I have to be with him. My hands clenched, fighting the overwhelming urge to lash out. I knew I had to maintain control. Deep down, I understood that resorting to violence would achieve nothing. I didn't want to reveal the extent of my hurt, nor was I willing to plead for her to stay. Begging for her affection felt like the epitome of weakness. Okay, I replied evenly, masking the turmoil within. If you want a divorce, it's yours. Confusion flickered across Cindy's face, mingled with a hint of hurt. Maybe she expected me to fight for her, but I knew deep down that if she'd made up her mind to leave, there was no changing it. Cindy seemed taken aback by my calm demeanor, but began packing her belongings. The following day, I took charge of our finances. I withdrew half of the funds from our accounts, setting up new ones in my name alone. I canceled our joint credit cards and obtained new ones in my name. I contacted a realtor to list our house for sale and consulted a divorce lawyer. Filled with resentment, I ensured Cindy was served divorce papers at her workplace, citing adultery as the cause. The divorce proceedings were relatively straightforward. With no children and a short marriage, there were few disputes. We split our assets evenly and parted ways. Kirk's divorce, however, was far messier. With a young child and a dependent spouse, he faced hefty alimony and child support payments. One aspect of Kirk's divorce provided a semblance of satisfaction. His attempt to cut costs on legal representation backfired, resulting in prolonged spousal maintenance payments. Two months after our divorces were finalized, Cindy and Kirk married. It was a bitter pill to swallow. In the aftermath of the breakup, I felt adrift. Drinking held no appeal, so I immersed myself in thoughts of revenge. Like many scorned partners, I scoured the internet for revenge tactics. Initially, violent fantasies consumed me, followed by plans to vandalize their property. Yet, I soon realized the futility and potential consequences of such actions. Reading countless stories of revenge only underscored the absurdity of my impulses. I found no satisfaction in pursuing vindictive acts that would only perpetuate the cycle of pain. 
Finally, I sought solace in counseling at my church. The pastor spent nearly two hours with me, imparting wisdom that revenge wouldn't heal the wounds of betrayal. Despite my initial skepticism, I realized the truth in his words. Remaining near Cindy, yet unable to be with her, only reopened the emotional wounds each time I saw her. Revenge, I understood, would only perpetuate the pain. So, I made the difficult decision to create distance between us. My opportunity arose when rumors swirled about the company's precarious situation. We had secured a lucrative contract with the Defense Department, promising substantial profits, but also significant risks. Tasked with developing classified software and electronics for the Air Force, the project was critical for national security and our company's survival. Yet, it was severely behind schedule and over budget, threatening financial ruin. As one of the senior software designers, I was called in to address the impending disaster. Many colleagues shunned the project, fearing professional and personal repercussions if they failed. However, with my personal life in disarray after the divorce and the painful revelation of Cindy's pregnancy, I felt I had little to lose. Examining the project's data, I realized the current approach was doomed to fail. I agreed to lead the project and relocated to California, putting thousands of miles between Cindy and me. Immersing myself in work, I made radical changes, overhauling the team and scrapping previous efforts, despite the tight deadline looming ahead. I may not have had engineering expertise, but I had assembled a team of the most innovative engineers in the company, even recruiting top talent from competitors. Initially skeptical, they were astonished when I outlined my vision for the electronic components. Once they grasped the simplicity of my approach, they were on board. Yet, the challenge remained in ensuring the software complemented our hardware. Gradually, we pieced together a program that I felt confident about. It wasn't until three weeks before our military delivery deadline that I knew we had succeeded. Our initial test combining software and electronics boasted a 96% success rate. As I reviewed the remaining 4%, I identified straightforward fixes. With the confirmation of our program's effectiveness, the company's stock surged by over 300 points within months. Subsequently, the Defense Department expanded our contract to encompass the Navy, Army, and Marines, promising billions in profits. But it didn't end there. Recognizing the program's potential beyond classified use, we adapted it for various commercial applications. Stripping away classified data, it emerged as a versatile platform with limitless practical possibilities. Following this triumph, I was promoted to senior vice president, tasked with spearheading the development of these commercial adaptations. In subsequent years, I made periodic visits to the Virginia headquarters, never encountering Kirk or Cindy. Although I had moved on, I had little desire for any interaction with them. The pastor's advice on the healing power of time and distance rang true. During one of these visits, I bumped into Kelly Bailey, a former cheerleader from Caverton High and Susie's best friend. I knew she had married Jason Bailey and had a son. Before Cindy, I had harbored a crush on Kelly. She was the epitome of popularity in high school, exuding warmth that made her universally liked. While time had aged her, she remained attractive. Physically, she was the antithesis of Cindy, petite with long black hair and a smile that radiated warmth. I was taken aback when Kelly recognized me. I had popped into the grocery store to grab some essentials before a board of directors presentation. These formal updates meant I'd be in town for a week, and the company provided furnished apartments for visiting executives, albeit empty of food. Randy, is that you? Kelly's voice broke through my concentration as I pondered frozen dinners. My surprise must have shown as I blushed when she repeated my name. There was still a lingering crush, despite her sprinkling of gray hair and fine lines. Kelly, I smiled as she maneuvered her basket beside mine. I'm flattered you remembered me. I wouldn't have, she confessed, if Susie hadn't pointed you out during lunch at Triorbit. You work at Triorbit? I was genuinely shocked. She nodded. For about six years now. I'm in marketing. It dawned on me that Kelly and I worked at the same company, a fact that I felt guilty for not knowing but my role had little overlap with marketing, so perhaps my ignorance was understandable. Still, I felt a twinge of remorse. How have you been? I inquired, hoping to ease the awkwardness. 
as well as can be expected, her tone tinged with sadness. I'm divorced now. Jason turned out to be a real scoundrel. He cheated with his secretary and a handful of others, even getting one pregnant. I divorced him, but he got off lightly. No alimony, just child support, which he's delinquent on. It's infuriating. I'm sorry to hear that, Kelly, I sympathized. I always hoped Jason would settle down after marriage. Kelly shook her head. It's not your fault, Randy. Relationships can be unpredictable. She paused, her emerald eyes reflecting pain. Realizing there was little I could say, I commiserated with her. I'm divorced too. Cindy left me for Todd. Kelly's expression softened. It's tough. Say, why don't you come over for dinner? I promise it won't be fancy, but it'll be a proper meal. The offer caught me off guard, but the idea of a home-cooked dinner was too tempting to refuse. I'd appreciate that. It's been ages since I had a home-cooked meal. That evening with Kelly was delightful. She prepared a delicious meal of meatloaf, mashed potatoes, string beans, and sherbet for dessert. It was refreshing to have someone to converse with. Scotty, her outgoing son, joined in our discussions. We bonded over our shared enthusiasm for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, a team I avidly supported as a season ticket holder. I'd often take clients or friends to games, and if I couldn't find company, I'd give away the extra tickets. I wish I could go to a game someday, Scotty sighed. On second thought, let's discuss it, Kelly responded to his longing gaze. Later, I apologized for my hasty offer. I'm sorry about the Buccaneers' invitation. It slipped out before I realized. But, if you're okay with it, I'd be delighted to take Scotty to a game. Kelly regarded me with a thoughtful expression. You're a kind man, she chuckled. I appreciate the gesture. Relieved, I pressed on. Would it be all right if I asked you out when I'm in town? I enjoyed our conversation. Kelly smiled warmly. I'd be happy to. I always thought highly of you. Let's catch a Buccaneers game together. I left Kelly's place feeling hopeful, excited about the prospect of spending more time with her and Scotty. Maybe this could be the start of something meaningful. Over the next year, I made a point to call Kelly whenever I returned to Virginia, sometimes even planning trips back east just to see her. Initially, our relationship was purely platonic, born out of a genuine friendship and mutual enjoyment of each other's company. I remember taking Kelly and Scotty to the final game of the season. The Buccaneers needed a win to secure a playoff spot, and when they did, Scotty was ecstatic. Later that night, after Scotty had gone to bed, Kelly unexpectedly knocked on my door. Is everything all right? I asked, concerned. Is Scotty okay? Everything's fine, she assured me with a smile. Scotty's fast asleep, thrilled about the game. I just thought we could have a drink and chat. As I began searching for my pants, Kelly entered the room. Flustered, I couldn't find them anywhere, prompting a giggle from her. If it eases your discomfort, we can both be in our underwear, she suggested, undoing her skirt. Now we're on equal footing. Fix us a drink and join me. I complied, mixing us each a rum and coke from the minibar. As I handed Kelly her drink, I couldn't help but notice her sitting cross-legged on the bed. Trying not to stare, I joined her, feeling the tension ease as we conversed over our drinks. When we finished, I offered to make another, but Kelly declined. I assumed she'd be heading back to her son, but to my surprise, she stayed put. Feeling unsure of what to do next, I disposed of our cups and returned to my seat. Suddenly, Kelly leaned in and kissed me softly on the lips, sending a jolt of electricity through my body. She noticed my surprise and smiled, revealing that she had been hoping for this moment for months, dispelling any notion that she was still the unattainable high school cheerleader I once perceived her to be. Kelly's insight was uncanny. I had indeed harbored feelings for her, but had been hesitant to act on them, fearing it might jeopardize our friendship. Finally, I mustered the courage to lean in and reciprocate the kiss, our lips intertwining in a passionate embrace. Her taste was intoxicatingly sweet. When we pulled apart, I couldn't help but express my admiration for her. Kelly then nestled her head against my chest, her hand finding its wake in my crotch, where my arousal was evident. 
Despite my arousal, I couldn't shake my insecurity, fearing I wouldn't measure up to her ex-husband, who, like Kirk, was well endowed. Before I could voice my concern, Kelly silenced me, reassuring me that size wasn't everything. She candidly shared her experiences with her ex-husband, revealing that his size often caused discomfort rather than pleasure. It was a revelation that put my fears to rest, reminding me that intimacy isn't solely about physical attributes. As we continued our conversation, Kelly decided to change the subject, shifting the focus away from our former spouses. With a playful gesture, she pushed me onto the bed, beginning to undress. Witnessing her reveal her flawless figure, I was captivated by her beauty, feeling a surge of desire unlike anything I had experienced before. I indulged in kissing and caressing, alternating between Kelly's breasts, eliciting moans of pleasure from her. With her panties removed, I slid two fingers inside her, finding her incredibly wet and ready. I continued pleasuring her until she climaxed, her body trembling with ecstasy. As she caught her breath, I lay beside her, basking in the aftermath of her release. In a matter of moments, Kelly eagerly removed my boxer shorts, expressing her longing for intimacy. She confessed to fantasizing about us for months, her desire reaching a fever pitch. With our inhibitions cast aside, I positioned myself atop her, savoring the sensation of entering her. Despite her petite frame, she accommodated me effortlessly, her arousal evident in her gasps and moans of pleasure. I thrust vigorously, striving to prolong the experience as long as possible. When I sensed Kelly approaching climax once again and could no longer contain myself, I climaxed inside her, the intensity of the moment overwhelming us both. As we lay intertwined, I realized with a start that I had forgotten to use protection. Concerned, I confessed my oversight to Kelly, fearing the consequences. To my relief, she brushed off my worries, expressing her willingness to welcome any potential outcome. Her declaration of love filled me with warmth and gratitude. That night marked a pinnacle of intimacy, surpassing even my first encounter with Cindy. Kelly experienced multiple orgasms while I reached heights of pleasure previously unknown to me. Though Kelly didn't conceive from our passionate union, we took precautions thereafter. Six months later, Kelly and I became engaged, much to the delight of her son, Scotty. A year later, we exchanged vows, embarking on a new chapter together. Meanwhile, Jason continued to be a neglectful presence in Scotty's life, harboring resentment toward me. His ongoing friendship with Kirk provided him a platform to boast about Kirk and Cindy's seemingly idyllic life. However, their happiness no longer stirred any jealousy in me. On one occasion, I made the mistake of intervening in Kelly's dispute with Jason over child support. Her stern rebuke reminded me to respect her autonomy in handling such matters. From then on, I deferred to her judgment, understanding that it was Scotty's well-being at stake. In December, I was set to be appointed executive vice president of the company. The announcement was scheduled for the Christmas party, slated to take place at the Washington Convention Center with a sizable attendance. While I felt a bit bashful about the attention, Kelly was overjoyed. You've earned this recognition, she scolded me gently for my reluctance. I've heard countless stories from colleagues about your indispensable contributions to the company. They also mentioned you're slated to succeed Mel as CEO next year. Perhaps, I replied modestly, but none of it matters as much as being married to you, the most beautiful woman in the world. And I have a surprise for you, she said, her smile widening. Remember when the condom slipped in Kansas City? I nodded, a grin spreading across my face. You don't mean... Her nod confirmed it. Yes, I'm pregnant. Now, there's no way I'm ever letting you go. She embraced me tightly, and I knew that if not for the impending party, we would have indulged in each other all night. Anticipation coursed through me, knowing the fun we'd have after the celebration. Admittedly, I'm not much of a party person. The novelty of such events has long worn off, but Kelly still finds enjoyment in them, especially when I'm by her side. Her magnetic presence draws people in effortlessly. After a few dances, just as we were about to return to our table, we crossed paths with Kirk and Cindy, who arrived late, accompanied by Jason and his date, Kathy. I was taken aback by Cindy's noticeable weight gain and Kirk's slight paunch, concealed beneath his coat. Jason, as expected, remained in peak shape, a testament to his ongoing pursuits. 
Uncertain how to react, our attention was diverted by an announcement over the public address system. May I have your attention, please? It was Mel Stanton, the CEO of TriOrbit. I promise not to bore you with a lengthy speech. As many of you know, we've been searching for a replacement for Charlie Brenner, our retiring executive vice president. While the board deliberated for months, I had my pick from the start. After countless interviews, the decision has finally been made. I'm thrilled to introduce our new executive vice president, Randy Clipson. Suddenly, a spotlight illuminated me, and the room erupted in applause. Kelly drew me close, planting a passionate kiss on my lips. Once the excitement subsided and the party resumed its normal rhythm, I glanced over at Cindy, Kirk, Jason, and his date. Unsure of what to say, I felt a wave of tension emanating from the group. Jason looked visibly agitated, while envy flickered in Kirk's eyes. But when I caught Cindy's gaze, I saw a hint of sorrow and regret. Unsure of how to navigate the situation, Kelly stepped in. Kirk, Cindy, Jason, it's lovely to see you. She greeted them warmly, embracing each one in turn. Then, turning to Kathy, Jason's date, she extended her hand. Nice to meet you, Kathy. Following Kelly's lead, I shook hands with Kirk, Jason, and Kathy, offering Cindy a gentle hug. As we exchanged pleasantries, the music resumed, and Kelly surprised me with a suggestion. Randy, why don't you dance with Cindy, and I'll take a spin on the dance floor with my ex-husband. Kathy, why don't you join Kirk for a dance too? Perplexed, I glanced at Kelly, but she simply smiled knowingly. So, I found myself dancing with Cindy. How have you and Kirk been? I inquired, struggling to find words. Not great, she sighed. I think we're headed for divorce. I'm pretty sure Kirk's been unfaithful. I'm truly sorry to hear that, I offered sympathetically. Do you really mean that, Randy? She questioned, her skepticism evident. I half expected you to say it serves me right. I would never say that, I responded, initially taken aback, but then realizing the truth in her words. Well, if I'm honest, maybe I would have said something like that initially after our breakup. But I couldn't harbor hatred towards you. You were my first love, and losing you was painful. But life moves on, and so have I. The music ceased, and tears welled up in Cindy's eyes. Leaving you was my biggest mistake, and I can't undo it. As Cindy walked away, her tears flowing, Kelly wrapped her arm around me, prompting me to lean down and kiss her. How was your dance with Jason? I asked. He's still the same, she replied, a smile playing on her lips. He actually tried to make a move on me, claiming he's ready to settle down and take me back. I just laughed it off, telling him I have the greatest man in the world. Observing Cindy at her table, tears still evident, and witnessing a heated exchange between Kirk and Jason, I reflected on the pain of Cindy's departure and the vengeance I once sought. The pastor's wisdom rang true, time and distance had been my healers. As I mentioned earlier, though I abandoned thoughts of revenge, I realized I had indeed achieved it. My revenge lay not in bitterness but in living well, loved, and utterly content. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Write your opinion in the comments.